آله وصحبه ومن سوري فقط اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر وأنت على كل شيء قدير إن إن ذنيم بوا الله سبحانه وتعالى the most compassionate the most merciful all praise and thanks are due to him and peace and blessings be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم he who is guided No one can misguide him. <coughs> and he who is misguided, no one can guide him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I beg your pardon, I apologize for the, uh, uh, the bad broadcasting uh, quality. يعني, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. <coughs> time uh, two weeks ago we feel <coughs> we highlighted the concept of muakha if you remember how Prophet Muhammad made a unique incident in the history of humanity if you can remember now the the brotherhood he came for they were about do you remember the number 90 45 with 45 from the muhajirin the immigrants and with the ansar the helpers so he used to bring for example such and such sahabi from <coughs> the muhajirin he will do the muakha the brotherhood now we highlighted this, how they shared with them their money, their wealth, everything just to help them and how some of them, they refused to take anything, they said just show me where is the market. And um, today we will highlight something which was more than amazing, which is al mirath wal Earth. Now, when the Mu'akha, the Brotherhood happened, it included the inheritance. Can you imagine that? But for a short time. You know what does it mean? <laughs> you know what does it mean? Once Prophet Muhammad said, this is your brother, he will share him. And if the Ansari passed away, the Muhajir will inherit him. It's, it's mind blowing in our measurements now. This happened 1400 years ago. Now in our terminology, please, if you want to talk about it, use what I may call it in my words now, the social security system. By the way, one of the main reasons why some people, they leave their countries and come to Western countries such as Canada, United States, and some European countries. What? The level of life, including benefits and the social security. True or false? Forget the, the very exceptional cases, the wars and the asylum seekers, I forget, I'm talking generally. The majority of immigrants, they seek such countries for the sake of what? Many of them, they say, I want child benefits for my kids. I want social security. I want them to be, you know. By the way, social security system, to the best of my knowledge, the first person on the planet Earth who made it as part of the constitution and the system of the state is Umar al-Khattab. You need to know that. <clears throat> now, we can look at this as, as a, like a spark, okay? But as a system of a state, it was Umar al Khattab. Do you remember the story? Actually, he did it in different situations. And by the way, just pause. Umar al Khattab, who stayed in Khalifa for about 10 years and a half or 11 years, he did a lot of things they were called in the history of Islam and in the language of Islamic jurisprudence, which is al fiqh al Islami and the language of the principles of Islamic jurisprudence, Ilm Usul al-Fiqh, Awwaliyat Umar al-Khattab. 
that thinks that the first one who did it in Islam was Umar. Do you know that PhD thesis and master's degree are written about this? Collected what was the first thing that Umar did it as what? As a head of a state. And I'm talking about civil society now, 1400 years ago. Such as, do you remember the story? Umar used to do what we call Al-Asas. You know what's Al-Asas? Non-Arabs, non-Arabs. Do you know what's Al-Asas? طيب Arabs. What is Al-Asas? Azzaq Allah khair. It's the night patrols of police. The night police patrols. The Uriyat al-Shurta al-Layliya. You know, it was part of Umar al-Khattab's daily things that he used to do it. When everyone is asleep, he used to walk, you know, between the neighborhoods, you know, the streets, just to make sure everything's okay. So in one of the incidents, <coughs> approaching the Fajr, let's say two, three hours before the Fajr, he was just making sure that everything is okay. So he heard, you know, the screaming and the crying of a very young child. He, it was very annoying to a degree, the people in the neighborhood definitely, maybe they were not able to sleep from him. So he shouted from behind the wall, he said, Ya Amat Allah, hey, the mother of this child, take care of him, do something feed him, uh, take care of him, breastfeed him, whatever, I mean, do something. Don't just leave him cry. He, you know, he shouted from behind the wall. He took around, took around, then came back again, the same thing, still crying, crying, crying loudly. He said, Ya Amat Allah. <laughs> he said, you, you know, the servant of Allah, do something. Third times, he became very angry. He said, Wallahi ma araki illa umma su'a. He said, by Allah, I don't think that unless that you are a bad, a bad mother. You are not taking care. You know, he does not know her. And she does not know who is him. He heard just someone, you know, from the neighborhood, say, hey, take care of your child. Hey, take care of your child. You want to sleep. So he was doing this as a police person on behalf of the society. It's exactly like when a police person say, be careful, your speed limits. Or on behalf of the society. Anyway. Then she said, Dak anni. He said, go away, you don't know what I'm suffering. He said, you know, this is behind the wall, just this is screaming. <laughs> okay, what's your problem? She said, in the Amir al Mu'minin Umar qad farada fardan li kulli maftumin fil Islam. He said, Amir al Mu'minin has decided to give a monthly salary, like child benefit, exactly, for any child who finishes his breastfeeding period which is two years, on average. This mother was so poor, when she knew that in case her child has stopped breastfeeding, she will be entitled to have what? Uh, monthly salary, child benefit, which is a good amount of money, <laughs> you see? <laughs> now some people, they live with that. The one who has seven kids from the immigrants, he's a king. Yes, child benefits sometimes about four to five thousands. <laughs> Better than university professor at the university. Well, like, <laughs> subhanAllah. So, the child, she was very poor, and the child still is in need for the milk, and she's forcing him to eat the bread. And he's refusing. He can't, he can't eat yet. And she wants to force him because she wants the money. When he discovered, he was shocked. Abu Khattab said, what? Now, the narrator of the, 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 this riwayah, uh, this story, he said, فَرَجَعَ عَمَرُ الْخَطَّابِ They were approaching the Fajr prayer. And he was the Imam. You know, the Khalifa is the Imam. So he was leading the prayer. The narrator says, وَاللَّهِ مَا سَمِعْنَا قِرَاءَتَهُ مِنْ بُكَاءِهِ We could not hear the recita recitation of the Quran because he was crying. But you know, he was touched. Then what did he say? They discovered now the story, then asked him what happened, and they were narrating. Uh, said when he finished, he turned back looking to the Musalleen, like the Imam when he finishes, 
قال ويحا عمر كم قتل من أبناء المسلمين he said wow and to me how many kids of the Muslims I have killed actually it's not his fault he's doing something good it, how come it did not come to my mind that in case if the limitation is the, the end of the breastfeeding قال ففرض فرضا لكل مولود يولد في الإسلام then he took a decision power authority child benefits by the time of the birth immediately just she gave birth entitled for a monthly salary. This is social security. By the way, you, you, from one angle, please know your religion. From another angle, be proud of your religion. Wallahi, be proud. You actually, you have to be proud. You can't but to be proud. <laughs> Third message, let people know. Because this uniqueness of Islam, by the way, let people know this is not my production or production. This is not my. <laughs> it's Allah's. <laughs> Allah is the one who designed Islam, not me, <laughs> not you. We are proud of it as a divine production. Allah is the one who designed Islam. So you will be proud not out of showing off. No, out of izza, out of you know have this kind of you know uh, to to be proud in a good sense, not. You know, with arrogance, walayadu billah. No, no. You are proud with humbleness, not proud with arrogance. This is a big difference between izza and takabur. You see? When you are proud with humbleness, this is izza. When you are proud with arrogance, this is takabur. Like Iblis. Anyway, um, my point now, we are in the context of how Muhammad Wasallam made the brotherhood. This is some of the seeds of the social benefits up to the degree of inheritance. Now we are talking about Umar as one of the greatest students of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By the way, Umar, if I'm not mistaken, could be considered in the early age of Islam, one of the, Umar and Abu Bakr, the best two who applied Islam on a state level ever. And by the way, both of them, they did not narrate a lot of ahadith. Because simply they were busy in what? Establishing, building, constructing. Umar, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, they were sitting for, for knowledge. Abu Bakr and uh, it's an, an, an administrative duty. Do, construct, build, help, okay? Stop the injustice, attack the oppressor. This is what Umar did. That's what I'm talking about. The awwaliyat, uh, what? Umar, radiallahu anhu. And the other amazing thing, which you needed to speak special with non-Muslims. Umar in his time, he was once, because it was very famous for Umar, that he used to walk always between the people, day and night. He was not sitting in his ivory office with 10 meters long, 10 guards outside, no, 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 no. It was always outside, walking, making sure everything is okay. Economy, market, cheating, people, thugs, gangsters, something. I, I, anything happens immediately. Quick action. So he saw one from the people of the book, a very old, very old, poor Jewish guy. He was doing what? Begging the people. You know, asking for sadaqah. He was so poor. And he was a Jew. Then Umar al-Khattab looked at him without even asking him. He said, Ma ansafnak. We took the jizya from you when you were young and we made you in need when you are. He said, we did not do injustice for you. Because as a non-Muslim, because you don't fight in our army, we ask you to pay. This is, by the way, the concept of jizya. If any non-Muslim in Islamic State decided to be in the army, he will not pay anything. It's like paying a tax in case if you don't want to go to the army. Exactly. Exactly. I, as a Muslim, should die on your behalf to protect you. If you don't want, because it's not compulsory on you as a non-Muslim to be part of the army. This is the concept. Because some people say, ah, jizya. Jizya, and of the highest respect for It is an option for a non-Muslim not to serve in the army, which means not to die.
Are you with me? 1400 years ago. Who did it in the history? If you hold a religion or a belief or a faith against the state, not like them, do they allow you to have them? Even now, now, now. You know? Under the light of different slogans, you will not be allowed. If, if the uh, service in the army is compulsory, you have no option. You will not have an option. We had it a long time ago. You have the option. Do you want to be with the army? You die like us on behalf of the state? Yes, yes, no. I don't want, okay, pay tax. So that's it. Anyway, so Omar, when he looked at him, he said, we did not do justice for you. Because as a non-Muslim, you pay, if, if you are entitled, if you have a money, you pay when you are young. And now you are in need. Then he decided to give everyone like him from the social benefits of the treasure of the state of in Islam, a non-Muslim. The people when they speak about, uh, what they call it, accepting others, tolerance, you know, different faiths, you know, pluralism, you these, these things. We did it long time ago. La ikrah And I'm talking about justice in finance and the economy and civil rights now. Let's go back. Uh, you know, I gave you an idea how these roots were implemented by the caliphs later on. Because they were students of Muhammad Sallallahu Okay? So, now, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now, the, uh, <coughs> as Zubair ibn Awam, I need to keep, keep fixing this. Do you, do you remember who's as Zubair ibn Awam? Who knows as Zubair ibn Awam is the husband of who? Who's the wife of Az Zubair ibn Awam? Uh, Nana Aisha, Nana Aisha, sister. Sister of who? Uh, Aisha, Nana Aisha. Oh, no, 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 Asma. Oh. Oh. Asma was... I want to ask about his mother, not his wife. So sorry, sorry. Did I say wife or mother? So sorry, astaghfirullah I'm sorry. Yes, yes. His wife is Asma. Uh, I, I, my mind, I want to ask about his mother. Sorry. Do you know who's the mother of Az-Zubair bin Awam? Hmm? Safiya, mashallah, yes. Who's Safiya? Yes. The aunt of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa She's the wife of Abu Talib. Safiya is the mother of Zubair bin Awam. His wife is Asma, the sister of Aisha. Their son is Abdullah bin Zubair, the great fighter against Al-Hajjaj, one of the biggest dictators in our history. By the way, I read in the seer about Sophia when she was raising a Zubair at Al-Jahiriyyah before Islam. Part of her this is, uh, has nothing to do with the education in our time, okay? So don't quote it, but just I want to tell you the history. Safiya, part of what she used to do with Az Zubair, one of the greatest heroes and his son in Islam, when he was a very young child, she used to take him at night to a far cave from the house at night. And she used to leave him for a while there, sitting alone at night in a cave. And they were asking, okay, what are you doing? She said, I want to kill fear in his heart. <laughs> no fear. <laughs> you know, can you imagine a kid alone in a cave in the desert 1400 years ago? <laughs> this is how she raised a Zubayr I'm not saying this is, uh, <laughs> this is applicable, no, be careful. But this happened in the history. Now, because of, because of this mentality, his son is a Zubay, uh, Abdullah. Abdullah Zubayr, when he was a very young child, one of the amazing stories of Abdullah bin Zubayr, when Umar al-Khattab was a Khalifa, Umar al-Khattab, the great men used to fear him. Some of them, according to narrations, they used to shake when they say Umar, because Umar was a giant. Giant, you know? 
and his character really used to scare everyone. So he was walking, you know, so a group of children, they were playing. When they saw Omar, all of them, they disappeared, except Abdullah bin Zubair. He just stayed there. He was a very young child, maybe 50 centimeters, like this. And by the way, Omar, to the best of my knowledge, he was, I think, approaching two meters. Because Umar al-Khattab and Khalid walid they are relatives, when they used to ride the horse, nearly their legs touching the ground. They were huge, yes. And when they were walking, sometimes people used to think they are riding a horse. Yeah, I mean, so, so Umar, Umar, it's not just a physical. In the character and the physical body as well. Umar, so he was walking with all of his prestige and something. That, you know, children, when they saw Umar, disappeared, except Abdullah and Zubay. So Umar was wondering why this child, in specific, he did not know him. Why this child did not fear him? He came to him, he said, hey, why you did not escape? Did you know what he said? He said, لم أفعل شيئا لأهرب منك وليست الطريق ضيقة لي وسع لك. He said, first, I have done nothing to feel afraid of you. Second, the road is not narrow so that I have to leave a space for you. You can pass by. I have no problem. Then he asked, who is this? They said, Abdullah ibn Zubayr. He was a child. <laughs> Abdullah ibn Zubayr was the great knight and fighter against Al-Hajjaz, one of the most well-known dictators in our history. So sometimes, you know, when you see the lenient, you can tell the son of this could be what? <laughs> this is how they used to raise, Alhamdulillah now, some of our kids and some Muslims, they are raised on TikTok, dancing. You know, campus, 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 yes. <laughs> they say, yes, yes, like, like. <laughs> May Allah that one, okay. When you see Abdullah ibn Zubayr and Zubayr ibn Awam, and you see Usama ibn Zayd, when you see Al-Hasan ibn Hussein, Mu'adh ibn Mu'awad ibn Afra, you see what we are doing or what happens now for some of our kids, Allah, you cry. Alhamdulillah, I'll call it a Now, as Zubayr ibn Awam, قال, I'm, I'm quoting part of his, because a lot of details we don't need it. قال, in, ذلك أن معشر قريش لما قدمنا المدينة ولا أموال لنا فوجدنا الأنصار نعم الإخوان فواخيناهم وأورثناهم. He said that he is talking that when we came as a Quraysh and we don't have a money and the helpers, the Ansar, they were the best brothers. We did have this kind of brotherhood and the inheritance. Then he mentioned Abu Bakr became the brother of Kharaj bin Zayd, Umar with Fulan, Uthman bin Affan with someone from the people of Bani Zurayq. Uh, you know, he, he gave details about this. Then uh, later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abrogated the inheritance. It happened just, just for a while, not for a long time. I, I was not able to know exactly for how long. Was it months or one year or two years? I don't know, but it was for a short time. It happened just to establish this thing and they accepted it. Then it was abrogated. Do you know this terminology? Abrogation. Are you familiar with this? Neskh. Now, okay. Neskh or abrogation means a ruling, a teaching after it has been said it is deleted or cancelled. This is called nasikh. Nasikh al-hukum, to delete it. Okay? To stop it. It's not valid anymore, or it's not a ruling or teaching anymore. The Arabic, Islamic terminology is a nasikh. The English, abrogation. Okay? Then قال, uh, it was abrogated. <coughs> then, the uh, writer of the seer, he says, Allahumma salli wa sallam, Muhammad. قال, وَلَا يَعْنِي نَسْخُ التَّوَارُثْ أَوْ رَفْعُهُ التَّوَقُّفْ عَنْ بَاقِي حُقُوقُ الْمُؤَاخَى However, when Allah revealed to Prophet Muhammad that stop, ask them to stop inheriting each other, this was not applicable on other 
rights of brotherhood. It was just about inheritance, which is the money inheritance. All other rights of muakha, supporting, taking care of them, it was completely still applicable. قال بل استمر ذلك ولا بد أن يستمر. But that continued because it should continue because Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the Quran إن المؤمنون إخوة فاصلح بينه. Verily indeed believers are brothers. And عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله عنه روى قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال المسلم أخ المسلم لا يظلمه ولا يسلمه من كان ومن كان في حاجة أخيه كان الله في حاجته ومن فرج عن مؤمن كربة من كربة فرج الله عنه كربة من كرب يوم القيامة ومن ستر مسلما ستره الله يوم القيامة. This hadith just to confirm that the abrogation of inheritance after the muakha at the beginning it was applicable just the physical inheritance not all other rights. He quoted this, that the Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. He does not wrong him or turn him in. And whoever fulfills his brother's needs, God fulfills his need. And whoever relieves a Muslim of distress, God will relieve him in one of the distresses of the day of resurrection. And whoever covers a Muslim, take care, you don't do sitter. Qal God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cover him in the day of Resurrection. This is like an idea about the rights of the Muslim, any Muslim upon you. You have to take care. He's your brother, exactly like your brother. You don't have a, just when you are angry, just to say anything. Okay? If you know part of his private secrets, just to go and use it as you. No, 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 no. This is hurumat call. This is prohibited areas. You have to take care of these things. Okay? Time. Now, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Now we asked in the very beginning of the establishment of Al Madina, we have a, another unique incident. To the best of my knowledge, in the history, it's the, the first time in the history that happened in this way. Now, it's called Hikayat As Sufa. What? As Sufa. It's a special name. You will know what do we mean by it. Now, قال حتى تتأكد العناية النبوية بالمهاجرين الذين تركوا أرضهم وديارهم فقد جعل لهم في آخر المسجد النبوي مكانا اسمه الصفة ويطلق عليه صفة المهاجرين Now a Sufa actually it's a special name for a location or part of the masjid of Prophet Muhammad and it covers the end of the masjid. It's exactly like, can you see our masjid now? The sofa is the area of the sisters. Okay? It's a special place. They used to call it Sufat al-Muhajirin. Okay, what is Sufat al-Muhajirin? Which is part of the masjid at the end of the masjid. قال <coughs> It was a special place for the muhajir. Anyone who would like just to be disconnected from material life, he wanted just to do the qiyam and ibadah and tahajjud, the people used to come, not to the front of the masjid, at the end of the masjid. At the beginning, at the beginning, the muhajirin who did not find a place to sit, or anyone to do muakha with them or for whatever or they were very poor they don't have families they are not married it's like a special location to take care of them okay later the people who wanted just to be disconnected from any kind of busy life and to be just devoted to Allah they used to come any visitor to the Medina they were not hotels at that time there's no hotels and motels and uh, no Airbnb at that time. Nothing at all, you know. Either you know someone or someone invites you to his house or there's no place. So by default, it became like an open place for anyone who needs a place to live or to sleep. Now, the interesting thing, قال وكان أهل الصفة قد انقطعوا للعبادة والعلم والجهاد the people who used to take that location, they used to be isolated from everything except three things, which is 
אל עיבאדה, אל ג'יהאד. עיבאדה, וורשיפ. כפולי דיווטד טו אללה, אל סיקינג דה נולג'. They are living in the masjid. Any moment Prophet Muhammad says something in the masjid, they are there listening. <laughs> so it's a 24-7 ilm halakhaz with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because by the way, at that time you need to know, Medina was not crowded like our time now. Yaakum Allah abu anhu kal halak. Umar ibn Khattab used to live very far from the masjid al-Nabawi. To a degree, you will be amazed to know that. The house of Umar ibn Khattab was so far. To a degree, he was not praying every day with Prophet Muhammad And he had a neighbor. So, because they lived far away, and sometimes a man should be there for the two families in case if they need to, to, to do something physical or to protect, or a, a thief could come because they were a little bit, you know, like in the suburbs. So he made like a deal with his neighbor. We don't want to lose anything Prophet Muhammad says, but if we both go, any moment woman needs a physical power of a man, because life was not easy like our times, be careful. Now you can travel for, for, for two years apart from your house, and your wife might not be in need even to leave the house, just even fast food, everything, everything, just it's an application or something. At that time, no. You want to eat, you have to bring pieces of wood, you need to cut them, you need to chop them, you need to burn the life, you need to milk the she-camel or the goat, you need to slaughter, you need to hold, you need to unskin, you need to protect, you need to fight, you need that at any moment. So, so they decided, Umar al-Khattab, that, okay, what shall we do? He said, one day you go pray all the prayers of Muhammad, you come and tell me anything he says. Next day, you stay with the two families, I go. <laughs> and I listen to anything that could be said by Prophet Muhammad, and I come and tell you. There is no, you know, alternately between. This is what Umar al-Khattab used to do. Yani Umar al-Khattab, the great Umar, every 48 hours, he used to witness just 24 hours with them with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu People of the Sufa, 24-7. So sometimes, sometimes, by the way, people of the sofa, many of them, they were very poor. Very poor, but the advantage stuck to Muhammad Sallallahu <laughs> SubhanAllah. Sometimes there is a khayr inside what you might hate. Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, for example, he, he's from Dawus, from a ta'if. He became a Muslim in a very late time, but he had no wife. No kids, no families, nothing at all. He came and he was from the people of the Sufa. He was sitting next to the room of Prophet Muhammad wherever he goes. Whenever just he passes from the Dujah Masjid, stuck like him, as we say, like his shadow. Whatever he breathes, actions, reactions, his smile, his, you know, scanner. You know, Abu Huraira was a you know, scanner of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What, in everything. I mean, literally, literally 24-7. That's why he is Rawiyatul Islam. All the time he's doing nothing but listening and memorizing and asking the Sahaba about what he missed. So he, that's why he narrated thousands of hadith, subhanAllah. Anyway, Sufa, I need you to understand this place, a Sufa. قال كان أهل الصفة قد انقطعوا This is not part of the session, okay? قد انقطعوا للعبادة So they were dedicated for for the worship and for the علم for the knowledge and for the jihad وكانت نفقتهم Here comes the beautiful thing now وكانت نفقتهم على أغنياء المسلمين All of their living expenses it was completely covered by the rich Muslims. So it's like, like a special location of a free, open, 24-7 hostel. Okay? Now it is known, anyone there means he is in need. Anyone wants to do sadaqah, extra food, kafara, for the sake of Allah, they all bring the food there. So food and drink. 
So once you are there, you don't even think how to put any efforts to eat because the food will come to you. It's like another social security system and another concept of establishing the beauty of endowment, which is al-waqf. Because what is this? Later on, what is this? You are a visitor. You are a stranger. You want just to sit, just to worship Allah till you die. You want to ask forgiveness. Imagine someone, for example, was a very far from Allah or a very bad criminal, drug dealers, uh, murderer, whatever. He wants to repent. He wants just to be disconnected. Okay. He wants to sit five times to keep worshiping so that may Allah take his soul while he's doing the sujood. Okay, type. I want to sit there, but stop. I need to work to eat. Come on, sit somewhere and bring it to you. <laughs> Wallahi! It's a, can you imagine this? This is waqf. Waqf al Islam. They did not call it waqf. I'm telling you what later on these roots, you know, caused later on in our great Islam. For a sufa, in my terminology, it's one of the best free social support security system of endowments. Waqf. Place. You sleep. People, they give you time and, sorry, food and drink. You want to leave that to do the jihad, to, to, to protect your country? Tfadr. This is your free hotel. Plus food and that. Now, when you travel, when you want to work, what is the most difficult things in life now? Accommodation. Ask the people of Toronto now, especially downtown. It's, it's more than disaster. I think we all know because we are living here. We are very close. We are part of uh, Toronto. You see? In just a small studio. Hardly you can just do like this with your hand. Pay $2,000. And maybe if you did it wrongly, you will just hit the wall of your neighbor, you know? Well, why? People, they die with bills. You want to work very tough and very hard just, just to live in a place. This was for free. 1400 years ago, if you want. And people are taking care. In this context, subhanAllah, while I was preparing, you know, what I do, I read. When I'm reading, you know, ideas come to my mind. As I told you, in this lesson, we are not in a hurry. We are establishing, we are not just giving information. We are fixing misconceptions and we are establishing solid knowledge with connections, with understanding, okay? So I keep thinking, any related thing that could come to my mind related to this, subhanAllah. So I was just putting an idea and this could be, you know, the concept of waqf, endowment. I was writing notes for, 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 the, for the dars I'm preparing. Immediately, immediately, Harvard came to my mind. You know why? Because Harvard, and I will tell you why Harvard in specific. I mean Harvard University. Harvard University, they are one of, if not the biggest university, its expenses is based on endowment. The endowment is an Islamic idea. It's an Islamic application. It's an Islamic uniqueness. Now it's applicable on Harvard University. I went to the website of Harvard University while preparing your dust, just to give you the following idea. Then I will tell you why. Look now. Harvard is funded in part by an endowment. This is from their website. The endowment includes thousands of philanthropic gifts donated since Harvard's early history, many of which were given to support specific aspects of Harvard's teachings and research work. Together, these gifts form a permanent source of funding that connects scholars and learners from many diverse backgrounds with opportunities at Harvard now and into the future. Harvard's endowment has existed for nearly four centuries. 400 years. So they are proud of 400 years. I'm talking about 1400 years. Okay? 
Now, to current and future generations of Harvard students, faculty and researchers, it supports almost every aspect of the university's work. Now, look to the numbers from their website. $5.4 billion is the university's annual operating expenses in the financial year of 2022. $5.5 billion the operating expenses. Okay? Operating. <laughs> Type 14,000 different funds make up Harvard's endowments. 14,000 different funds they are supporting Harvard. 677 million granted in financial aid and scholarships in the 2022 year. They gave scholarships with about three quarter billion for the students around the world. 50.9 billion, the size of Harvard University's endowment in the year 22. So their endowments is equal to 51 billion dollars. To make it simple, it is the budget of the Hashemet kind Kingdom of Jordan five times. Yes? My country's budget is 10 billion. Harvard's <laughs> endowment five times. <laughs> nice. The idea is Islamic. But you know why I, I, I mentioned Harvard? Because unfortunately, we have some certain things which is much and could be uh, by the way harvard university is funded by fourteen thousand different funds not one they all together give 50 billion okay how many of you heard about the biggest single endowment on earth now do you know what is it in terms of its value the biggest waqf on earth in terms of the value who knows what is it the biggest ever, and it's in Guinness Records. Islamic. Al Rajihi, farm of palm trees. Mazrahat al Rajihi fil Qasim. 200,000 palm trees with the value of 15 billion. Saudi real. I don't know with the uh, who can uh, exchange it very quickly just to the US dollars. 15 billion Saudi real. 4 point something. Okay, 4.5 for example. The brother says about 4.5 billion. This is one single endowment by one person. Many people they don't know it. When I said Harvard, all of you recognized Harvard. True or false? When I said the biggest, many of us, we don't know Rajihi, Rahimahullah. We don't know his three and by the day. It is Waqf, do you know for what? Exclusively free dates for the Hujjaj al Mu'tabirin at Al Haramain. 24 7. There is high, prestigious, well prepared, fully manufactured dates for the millions and millions and millions and millions of people who come to the Haram. They are fed with dates with tens of tons on daily basis. It's what? By one person. About five billion dollars. We have it. Can you imagine if this is applicable all the Islam world? And by the way, one of the most important things, Abdul Nasser in Egypt, when he took the power and he attacked Islam and Muslims was to destroy the endowment of the Azhar. Do you know this? Do you know Al-Azhar was the biggest religious institution who has the highest, has, ha, highest value of endowment on earth, Al-Azhar, before Abdul Nasser. Now, Al-Azhar, about 70 years ago, was maybe 10 times richer than Harvard University. Do you know Al-Azhar used to have endowments in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, for Al-Azhar in Egypt? Do you know? 
Some people, they want Muslims from Singapore, from Hong Kong. But what's why he said this piece of land, this hotel, is an endowment for the students of Al-Azhar, the religious. After it was destroyed by Abdul Nasser and his people, and they controlled it, they did what they called Ta'meem. Ta'meem, which means the state will take over these things. Who knows what is the richest religious institution on earth now? You should know it easily. Vatican, yes. But do you know that Al Vatican has its own bank? Do you know it has its own financial system? And if you want to read about this, go and read the novel of Da Vinci Code. Just read it. It's just about 1,000 pages. It's very nice. Allah, I'm not joking. If you want to read Da Vinci Code, it's very well known. Read it in Arabic and English. I read it. From, <coughs> from the cover to the cover. <coughs> <coughs> you know, I'm just trying to highlight and to spread awareness about the concept of endowment. Which the root of it, one of the examples is Sufa. <laughs> to understand that we should be proud that this beautiful system that the greatest university on earth now, which is Harvard, basically is fully dependent on it. We created it. We made the people aware. And by the way, we should bring it back to the life because it helps. Because al -waqf, you do it for the sake of Allah. But, you, you, know, you know, because of Al-Awqaf, which is endowments, one of the main reasons why the ulama used to be very strong and powerful against any dictator regime in the history of Muslims because they were not employees under any authority. No one was giving them their salaries. The ulama of Al-Azhar, they used to elect Sheikh Al-Azhar from them. And no one was giving them their salaries. Okay, if no one is giving me my salary, and I'm not afraid out of hunger on my family. Many people, they are ready to say al-haq. Many people. Because, I mean, what, what shuts up the mouth of many people that they are afraid of, you know, their families behind them. Okay, I can't stand for torturing. I'm ready to die, but I'm afraid of al-fitna behind me. If there is a support social system for my family, I'm ready to stand for the haq. This is applicable to the majority of the people, by the way. Not every single person is Umar al-Khattab. And is ready to fight the people of Mecca. <laughs> no, most of us, we are ordinary, normal people. I mean, we can't do this. It's an, we are not Sahaba. So, but you can be having the ajr of a Sahaba if you think in the future how to bring this back to life. I said, what? I will give you a simple example. I'm not telling any one of you to be specialist in Islamic studies, but you can support anyone who would love to be a scholar in Islamic studies as part of your money without you yourself being a specialist and you will have his azure. Is that complicated or could be done? How can we bring it back? Let's think about it, just very simple. Imagine here in this masjid, let's imagine the population around us, or oh, forget the population, by the way, the population around us, there are 10,000. I'm talking Oakville. But those who pray in this masjid between Jum'ah and, uh, you know, daily prayers, they are about, generally, if, if I want to count the repetition, they are about 3,000. Imagine if 200 of them just, just 200 of them, it's about 7% of them, they said, why not together? And every one of us put, let's say, just five hundred or one thousand dollar, quarter million. They made a group. They go and do small business. This business exclusively is support anyone that is recommended by the masjid to do his Islamic studies in full, from BA to master's degree to PhD, and fully dedicated to educate our children. After twenty years, what will happen? 
In this area, you will have 20 big ulama, well-educated and well-prepared to take care of your kids. And no one has any kind of power to push them to say or to do. No, 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 no one, even yourself. <laughs> Look, I'll just give you a simple example. Simple example. This is one of why, why many ulama around the world, they are not able to say the haqq or to do the haqq, simply because they are looking to, they, they want to pay the bills. They want the bread for their kids. <laughs> this is a simple example about the importance of the endowment, the waqf, which was applied just, subhanAllah, by, by the blessings of Allah, without the preparation, just on the sofa. Just, I'm trying to connect into your minds the simple things. When it started then, it ended up, you know, doing what? Okay? Now, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Oh. 9.15? Okay. طيب, alhamdulillah. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I'm supposed to, uh, to, 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 to stop now. Next time, inshallah. If Allah will, inshallah, to start dealing with the covenant of the Medina, the charter of Al Medina, Mithaq Al Medina, the Stur Al Medina, which contains 51 articles or points of that agreement, like the Stur, the constitution of Al Medina between Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muslims and Jews and non-Muslims from, you know, a part of the Jews. It's an amazing charter or constitution that considered ultimately, exclusively, the first civil institution for a state in the history of Earth. Many people, they don't know about it. Because the concept of civil state that we are talking about, it started just, just, you know, around two to three hundred years ago. You know, I mean, what we know about what we call human rights, democracy, okay? The concept of nationalism, the elections, just after French Revolution. By the way, now, who's influencing the world with their ideas now? The West, true or false? Type. The West, they are proud of what they call human rights, democracy, civil society, true or false? Time. When did they start applying this less than 220 years ago? Yes, you need to know that. Because in the French Revolution started in 1789 and it ended up in 1798 French Revolution, which means 220, nearly five years ago, ended. By the end of the French Revolution, or be before the French Revolution, all Europe was based completely ex exclusively on monarchy systems. You know monarchy, what does it mean? Kings, kingdoms. And they have what they call, in their terminology, uh, feudal lord systems. Which means you have a king, under the king nobles, soldiers, and farmers, i.e. slaves. This is kingdoms, okay? All of your kingdoms did not have this, what we know as that. That's why they have the French Revolution. Then it was spread. Then they changed. They changed, changed, changed. You know, now we have this. So it, the spark started about 220 years ago. So the concept of a constitution and elections, look now to the United States. Now, the United States, they, they say, oh my God, I saw Brother Salman. This means, <laughs> this means, <laughs> okay, just two minutes, huh? Inshallah, inshallah. You know, when I see him, I know that I'm late. <clears throat> what I was saying? United States. United States. Huh? You said Oh, yes. <laughs> The United States, when they celebrate uh, independence, they celebrate what ex exactly? From the British. Yes, they celebrate kicking out British from their countries, fighting them and killing them. They were occupied by the British. 
They did not have civil society. True or false? 260 years ago. So you need to know the history that a constitution of a civil society, it was applied in Medina 1400 years ago. You need to do this, whether you want to study politics, history, social studies, you need to know this, to put it in the context, to know that you have something to provide for humanity. Because of Brother Salman, I have a stop. Assalamu alaikum, jazakallah khair. See you tomorrow on Tafsir, inshallah.